Thank you. So I'm going to try to make it a little bit interesting for everybody. Okay. So is everybody familiar with intellectual property? And what are the types? So what are the types of intellectual property? Does everybody know? Copyright, that's one. So if you look at this iPhone, we're going to go through and figure out what are the different types. So copyright is intellectual property. Is there another kind? Trademark. Patents. Most people think of patents. Okay, but then there's even a fourth one. So patents is usually what we think of, trademark, copyright, um, and then trade secret. Because sometimes you're, you don't want to disclose it. You want to protect it as long as you can, and so you don't want to disclose it. So if you look at the iPhone, for example, they've got tons of patents, right? They've probably got a patent on the battery, the antenna, um, just the look of it, the form of it. Some of the electronics, they probably have that protected, okay? For the trademark, they have different things trademark. Apple, that's trademark. iPhone, you're not going to steal that, okay? You're not going to use those names. Safari, things like that. Copyright, the ringtone, the code that they use, that's all things that they have, they have copyright protection on. Um, and then trade secrets, what are the trade secrets? Well, we don't know what they have as a trade secret, right? You don't have to disclose a trade secret. You can keep that confidential. But the only one that I think um, they probably have is something on the manufacturing process, right, for the glass. They probably keep that as a trade secret, okay, versus trying to protect that because manufacturing stuff is kind of very hard to enforce. So I'm going to talk mainly about patents today, okay, not copyrights. Um, I'm going to talk about patents, and there's really two types of main patent categories. There's actually another category, but really, when you think of patents, you're really thinking of the utility one, okay? So that covers things like the method of doing something, the manufacturing process, uh, a machine or a mechanism. Those are the ones that are covered in the utility patent. So most people, this is what you're talking about. Now, there are other patents or design patents are somewhat common, but these are more for like consumer products. So like the look of a car, the look of the iPhone, um, a chair, clothing, uh, things like that, toys. That's what it looks like, okay? So that's a design patent. Not a lot of people get these um, kind of in the medical area. Most are gonna be getting a utility patent, okay? And there are different rules, um, length of time for how valid they are. So I'm gonna mainly focus on the utility patent, okay? And so patents are pretty important. I was just doing a case study here uh, da Vinci came out with a new stapling system. Okay, that's pretty awesome. And hopefully you'll come up with a product that you're going to take to market as well. But there was patent. There was a patent out there that actually they did not own. Okay, and it looks pretty similar to this. And so Ethicon owns that. Ethicon was not as excited um, that this new product came out. So they went to court. So when you are looking at your product idea and you want to take it forward, it's really important to understand what patents are out there. Because if you get sued, at a minimum, you're going to spend $2 million, okay? At a minimum, $2 million trying to protect yourself, okay, or defend yourself. So it's, a very, it's very important to think about the decisions, what's out there, and the financial impact that it can have, okay? So patents are very, very important. Now, most all of you have an idea in here. So when it comes to intellectual property, once you have an idea, what's the next step? Well, the next step is you need to look at two different aspects, okay? You gotta look at patentability, and then you gotta look at your freedom to operate, okay? And so what are those things? Patentability means, can I get a patent? Can I get a patent on this idea, all right? So that's one thing. The second thing is freedom to operate. Will I get sued? That's basically what that means. So you don't want to get sued, right? So we want to avoid getting sued. So those are the two different things that you're going to do once you have an idea. So as far as what are you looking at to figure out if you can get a patent on this idea? You need to look at everything that is out there from a prior art standpoint. That means every article, every product that's ever been done, research paper, if it's in the US or China or Australia, it does not matter. Has it existed in the world? So you need to 
scour the earth and find out has it existed in the world? Because more than likely, there's going to be something that was close to what you've, you've come up with. Okay? So you need to make sure you are aware of it and distinguish yourself from what is out there. Because legally, when you file for a patent, you have to disclose the prior art. Okay? You have to say, this is out there, and you have to explain your invention, and you want to distinguish it. And so, does everybody know the most famous patent examiner? Right? All right? He was doing the theory of relativity at night. During the day, he was examining patents. So that's why I put that up there. But patentability, what are they looking at? So you send this off to a patent office. Maybe it's going to be the U.S. Maybe it's going to be in another country. What are they looking at? They're looking at, is your idea novel? Okay, so is it original? Is it non-obvious? And what they mean is, if I went and asked another biomedical engineer or another researcher in your area, and I asked them about this, would they say, oh, well, of course. That's, you know, that's obvious. That's obvious. This invention is obvious. That's the reference point that they use. So that's a, sometimes you could argue it's a bit hazy, but these are the two main elements that they look at. There's usefulness, but I think that that's not very... Terry, you can chime in, but I don't think usefulness is really ever... Have you seen a rejection based upon usefulness? No. Yeah. 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 So pretty rare. So really, I focus on the top two. Um, so, but an example of like obviousness, okay? What, there was a patent on a pencil, okay? And then somebody made the eraser, but then somebody came up with the idea, well, what if I take that eraser and I put it on the end of the pencil? Is that obvious or is that novel? Is that non-obvious? Do you think somebody, does that seem obvious to you, Ty? So they actually did get a patent on putting an eraser on the end of the pencil, but then somebody took them to court arguing that it was obvious, and it actually got invalidated later, that it was obvious to put it on. So, um, but that's what you're looking at. Is your idea novel? Is it obvious? And I always say this too. You can get a patent, but just because you have a patent, that does not necessarily mean it's of value. Okay? So you got to look at the claim to see what's in the claim. Okay, you can get a pat. Anybody can get a patent. Okay, but is it a useful patent? That's what you've got to figure out. Okay, you've got to make a strategy on that because this is one for the method of swinging on a swing. Okay, that's probably a waste of time. They probably just did it to prove a point. I'm not really sure. But I was going to go through a case study, the Dippin' Dots case study. I'm sure, you're all familiar with Dippin' Dots, right? Are you all familiar with the legal aspects of? Okay, so Kurt Jones comes up with the idea for Dippin' Dots, okay? I think he was in Tennessee. He came up with it, and he's going to start selling it, and he wants to protect this idea. So he actually gets a patent on this, which is pretty awesome. So he has protected his idea, and it's the method of how to make these Dippin' Dot ice creams, okay? So he goes to market, and he's selling it, okay? Mini Melts comes into town. Do you believe that? Mini Melts is trying to take his business. And he's not going to have it. So he is going to take them to court. So he takes them to court. And Mini Melts is trying everything. Okay, they're trying everything to maybe invalidate the patent or make an argument to say, hey, we're different than. And what happens is they throw a Hail Mary pass. And it actually works. They look at this patent and they find out that Kurt Jones had actually sold Dippin' Dots before he filed for his patent application. So they invalidated his patent because he had publicly disclosed his product. He had actually sold it. So once you start selling it, manufacturing and selling it, you cannot do a patent application anymore. It, go ahead. In the US. Well, yeah, I was going to get. Yeah, that's a new one. Yeah. You have the process. After, after he'd done it. Yeah, but, I mean, but the selling of the resulting product invalidated the patent off the way it was. That wasn't disclosing how it was made, was it? Uh, I'm not 100% of the right. detail. He based, yeah, practice that. Practice that. 
a process. I just heard Kurt Jones tell the story. I didn't actually get into the how they invalidate, but it was based upon him publicly disc, uh, selling it before he actually filed for his patent application. So now Kurt Jones does not work at Dip and Dots, right? He got kicked out of the company that he started and grew. So it's really important when you are working on something to think about, have you protected whatever you're disclosing to people? Okay, whatever you're doing, have you already protected it? So be judicious about what you are disclosing and sharing with people. That's the main point about that one. Okay, so the next step, so that's patentability and whether you can get a patent on it. Now the next one is freedom to operate. So freedom to operate, are you gonna get sued? So what you're looking at for that is you're looking at patents, but you're looking at active patents, okay? Because once it's expired, you're not gonna get sued on that. You need to look at active patents and you need to look at the claims the independent claims that are in there. Now, Terry may argue you need to look at dependent claims, but I always say, you let your attorneys look at the dependent claims, you really need to focus on the independent claims. Um, and this is true, is if you see a claim in a patent that you think is really close to what you're working on, never write that you infringe that, pat that claim, okay? You do not write that. You can say something nebulous like, hey, attorney, I think this is a patent of interest, okay? I think this is of interest, you take a look at it. But number one, you cannot make this determination. Uh, somebody, a, a judge can, right, court can. You can't make that determination. And then the other thing is, it makes you look bad if you have to go to court, okay? My boss had to read an email where he wrote that in the email in court, okay? So don't do that. Um, Anyway, so if you're looking at, let's say you're working on a time machine software and you go and you look and you come across this thing and the claim looks close to what you're working on, you shouldn't care about this one because it is a patent application, okay? So don't waste your time focusing on claims for a patent application, okay? Only focus on issued patents, okay? So it'll be a granted patent. You can tell they look different. It'll, one will say application, the other one won't. So only look at granted patents. And if it's granted, it only has a lifespan of a certain period, okay? So in the US, it is from this date that you filed it plus 20 years. So you do the math on it and you're gonna see, is it still active? Now I use uh, Google Patents and Google Patents will allow you to do your search so that you're only looking at active ones, it'll tell you if it's expired or maybe the patent fees haven't been paid. So you can, Google makes it a lot easier now, but you used to have to do the math always. So this is the math for how you determine if it is still active. Um, and then you go to the back page, go to the very back where all the claims are, and you're gonna look at the claims and you wanna focus on the independent claims, okay? So how do you know the difference between an independent and a dependent claim? All the dependent claims depend on another claim, okay? So you're only gonna have just a few independent claims, okay? Because the patent can have one invention. So I'm just gonna focus on claim number one. I'm not gonna focus on claim two, three, and four, da, 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 okay? So don't waste your time on that, okay? Only focus on independent claims of active patents. All right, so now we're gonna do a case study. Are you guys ready? Do you know everything you're supposed to do? So if you get hired and we're gonna develop, we're gonna get in the razor market, okay? Razor market's pretty lucrative. So we get hired and the boss brings you in and says, Gillette is killing us, okay? Gillette just came out with a Mach 3. Three razor blades, three. They now have 81% of the market. Todd, we need you guys to get together and come up with a new solution. You guys are gonna put your heads together, right? You're brainstorming, you're coming up with some great ideas. You come up, what's a great idea, Ty? <laughs> that is one strategy. We're going for four blades, right? Thinking outside the box, we're going for, we're going for four, okay? So what's the thing, what do you have to do? What are the two steps? 
So we have to do patentability, and then we're going to have to do freedom to operate. So when it comes to patentability, can I get a patent on the four blades? So what am I going to look at? What am I researching? Everything. Everything. I'm looking at patents. I'm looking at patent applications. I'm looking at products that are on the market in the US, internationally, everywhere. I'm going back. I'm looking back to see, has this ever been sold? We came up with a design one time. I worked on a project, and we found that it had been developed 100 years ago in France. We just happened to come across. It was an orthopedic instrument, and it had already been developed in France 100 years ago. So you really want to look and make sure this thing hasn't been all right, hasn't already been around. So you want to look at everything to see, has somebody done the four blade, OK? But you find out nobody has done the four blade, and you can get a patent on that. Congratulations, OK? So now we've got a patent. Hopefully, you'll get a patent with what you're working on. But now we've got a patent. So the next step is, what's the next step? Freedom to operate. All right, so are you going to get sued? So I'm going to go and look. I like to use Google Patents. There's actually at Georgia Tech's library, if you talk to Alicia Lee, she has like a really advanced search engine. Every uh, state has at least one site where you can do this advanced patent search. Um, and Georgia Tech is the site for Georgia. Okay, So we're very lucky. She holds classes. I think she's holding one next week on patent searching. Um, but she can really help you be like at the pro level uh, for really searching patents. But if you're at the amateurish mid-level, mid a lot of people will use Google Advanced, Google Patent Search. I think it's really useful. But if we're going to go in there, we're going to search for patents, okay? We're going to look for issued patents around these razor blades. So I'm going to go in there. And if I put in razor blades, I may get like 5 million searches. So sometimes I'm trying to narrow it down, and I'll look at like, for example, in this one, maybe I'll look at Gillette. But for products, you may look at Medtronic, Boston Scientific, things like that. I will point out that there's some companies that throw a bogey at you. Like Medtronic used to do their patents under, I think it was SDGI holding. So that's who the assignee was. We had a always look for that one. It's not always not always under their name. They throw it under something else sometimes. But uh, you can go ahead and look at the big competitors, and that'll help narrow it down of the ones you want to look at. So if I go and I look at the issued patent from Gillette, and I come up and they do have a patent on razor blades, what's the first thing I'm going to look at? Well, I'm going to look at the independent claims. First, I want to make sure it's still valid, right? Is it active or not? So what do you look at? Right, it was filed 2000, so I'm going to add 20 years to it. So technically, it's still active. Okay, technically, it's still active. So this is an active patent. So now I'm going to go and I'm going to look at the independent claims. Okay, and so do you remember which one's the independent claim? Right, it's the top one. Okay, because these other ones are all depend upon it. So if I go and I jump into it and I take a look at it, their patent is on a group of first, second, and third blade. They do not have a fourth blade. Whew. So we are now on the market. We got the four blade razor. We're doing some sales, making some traction. Great job, guys. Lee Corso's got a problem with it. What's the problem with it? That could be a fair hey, that could that could be a fair point. It could you could argue that. Okay. But the argument that they make is, how many blades does the Quattro have? It has four blades. Does it have three blades in there? It's three blades plus another one. So technically, they infringe that patent because you have three blades in there. So what you need to know is that a patent, so you can have a patent maybe on the four blade, 
Okay, but they get a patent on the three blade. Okay, so. So the, the point is, just because you have a patent, okay, it gives you the right to prevent other people from practicing what you have protected. Okay, it prevents other people. It does not give you the right to practice it always. Okay, you have to sometimes get a license to that other patent. Okay, so in this one, I may have to get a license for the three blade to be able to do mine. Okay, so you always got to make sure just because you get a patent, that doesn't mean you are free and clear to practice your thing. You still need to look and see out there what are the other patents, okay, because you may still need access to their patents. So they did actually go to battle for years and years and years, and they've gone back and forth and money. I don't even, it's, they don't publicly, they did not publicly disclose what the uh, settlement was, but they went back. For years and years, and to make it all worse, they came out with a five. You stopped at the four, you gone for the five. So um, anyway, so that's, that's our little use case. But the big thing to take away is when you have an idea, you need to be looking at patentability, whether you can get a, a protection on your idea, as well as the freedom to operate, OK? Are you clear? to actually practice this. So searching is really important. Um, it's really important to me to know the difference between the patents and the patent applications when you're looking for the patentability, or freedom to operate, rather. Uh, you can keep your eye on applications, but you, know, you can kind of see there is an application out there. But don't get thrown off by the claims, because the claims are initially written so broadly you're going to waste your time, okay, looking at these patent application claims. Because they are, I always say that, I, to me, they're a wish. I wish to get a claim around this area. But if you look at it, normally a patent application has claims you draft, and then the patent office says no, and so then you narrow it down, and they say no, and you're going back and forth to whittle it down to this thing. So don't get thrown off by the claims in an application, okay? That's a, to me, that's wasted energy. Um, anyway, that's it. You tell the difference. It says it up there. Um, as far as like patent, kind of the process, this should be more of the process than the strategy. But the process for protecting your idea, most of you probably have talked to your, your OTT person um, about this. But the first step most people will take in protecting your idea is they'll do what's called a provisional patent application. And that is less stringent than a non-provisional, OK? So this provisional, it kind of holds your place in line, but you're only holding your place in line for what you submit. So if you put garbage in there, you're not really holding your place in line, OK? You need to put as much of that invention as you can in your provisional patent application, OK? So you just sketching something out roughly and just making a few notes on there, you're probably not really protecting much with that, OK? You really want to be as thorough as you can in your provisional. But a provisional only costs a few hundred dollars. So it buys you 12 months of time. Once you file that, then you have 12, within 12 months, you need to file the non-provisional, OK? And the non-provisional is going to, now you're starting to talk money. Okay, this costs a few hundred dollars. If you're going to do this, you're going to just a U.S. patent. You're going to spend around 25 grand in legal fees, right? Your attorney fees, as well as filing fees. Okay, and then if you're going to start going international, you're going to start going this route, right? You have a great idea. You want global domination. You want to get EU protection and Japan and Australia and Canada. Okay, each country or each region. Now you're paying more money. So the university, you tell me if I'm wrong with Emory, but I know for Georgia Tech, right, you can pick all these countries, and you can file in all those countries. But eventually, if you're licensing that patent back, you are going to be paying for all those fees. OK? So you may say, I want to file in 100 countries, but now you're talking tons of money. So um, you got to be smart about that. But, U.S., if you just want U.S. 
coverage, you can do that. Most people want to do a PCT, which means you file a patent application, and then within 18 months, you do need to select the countries that you want to file in, you want protection in. So like I said, you may just do the, the regions where you think there's a big market. Um, and there's strategies even, if you go country by country, there's some areas where the legal process of defending your patent is so difficult that it's not even worth filing in those countries. So you really want to work with your attorney on where should you file from a PCT standpoint, which countries, which countries you want to designate. Good question. Does the patent can be given country for venison? It's it's manufacturing, selling. What's the third thing? There's manufacturing, selling, or use is the third. That's the three. Yeah. Right. Uh, the other thing I'll note too is if you do, if you are aware of a patent and you still proceed anyway, but you know that you're probably infringing it, um, and they take you to court, and if you lose, they can triple the damages. So they'll do treble, they got treble damages um, if you willing, willful infringement, right? I knew it was there, but I went ahead and did it anyway. They can say, well, we lost out on $100 million, and they'll triple that you're on the hook for 300 million. So be smart about that, right? So um, as far as, like I said, a provisional patent application, sometimes those are rough. If you go work at industry, I think they do a lot of napkin sketches, I'll say that, like one cheaters, not much into it. Georgia Tech and Emory have a little bit more uh, requirements where you have to specify the different, your idea and how it differentiates from what's out there. So it's a little more involved. So I think their provisional patent applications are better than what I've seen. Um, and then the next step is you're going to figure out, am I going to do U.S.? Am I going to do international? A lot of people do the PCT. I don't know. What's your breakdown, Terry? Is it? Yeah. Right. Yeah, so uh, Terry. Okay, so I can't remember what exactly the question was, but basically, oh, I was asking Terry about how, what the coverage is. Uh, so they will do, if they think there is an international market for an idea, they will evaluate doing a PCT application because it does give you greater coverage. But to a point Terry was saying earlier, and I'd meant to mention, was with your public disclosures, if you have an idea and you disclose it somewhere, you have lost all international rights to protect it. In the US, though, you do actually have a 12-month window that you can still protect it, OK? But you know, from a business standpoint, now it's not as valuable, because now your market is now just the US. And though the US is 35% of the global health market, it still you're missing out on the other 65%. It will. It depends on if your invention is described in there, because that's now going to be prior art once it's published. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right. So just saying that you're working on a device to detect cancer, diagnose cancer, right? That's not enabling, right? But to Terry's point, describing what's the enabling element, what are the steps, how is it done, and I can go off and build upon that or reproduce that, that would be something that would be a public disclosure. So some people get real protective and they don't even want to say what they're working on. If it's a new diagnostic tool, it, nobody's going to be able to replicate it just from you saying I'm working on a new diagnostic tool for blah, blah, blah. 
Okay, they're not gonna be able to do that. If you showed them your lab notebook or this experiment or something like that, then that's different. Okay, so you just saying that I'm working in a certain area is not gonna really be a risk. Like that step of provisional patent application and, and then you know, you're talking about like we don't want to disclose anything. So I guess that's where I'm trying to do. Well, if you, have it, if you have it disclosed in here, then you've protected it, right? You've, You've disclosed it, now you can start talking about it. But what you'll see with people is they put part of an idea and you've grown it and now you're out there talking about this, this new component of it and you didn't cover it in here. Oh, Michelle, what were you doing? Okay, so you just have to be careful about what you're disclosing to whom you're disclosing it. Yeah? One more comment about provisional patents is they do have to include, um, it has the same requirements for a non-provisional. It has to show enablement, it has to have mm -hmm. enough sufficient detail to describe right. the invention. It has to be an enabling description. doesn't have the same requirements for format, doesn't have to include claims, right. things of that nature that are required in the non-provisional, mm -hmm. but there still has to be basis in the provisional right. to write the non-provisional and get the coverage that you're trying to seek. So that's a good point, right? Mm -hmm. So I was talking about garbage, right? Garbage in, garbage out kind of thing. I see a lot of people submit patent applications mm -hmm. that are just high level, a picture, few markings on there, and they don't describe how, what's unique about the invention, how does it work, how do they make it, how do they test it, none of that stuff is in there. So that's not of use. They didn't really protect anything. Okay. So some people have a misconception about that. Yes, sir. You don't have to do a provisional. You can go straight to the non. Poorly executed provisional results in a bad outcome, even if he fully patented it. When would somebody be able to come back and point at your provisional and say, is it just sort of what you claimed? Let's say you do the. I think if you do a bad provisional and then you try to do your non provisional, I think you lose out on this date of your filing date. So now you're, because they're going to say, well, you didn't really cover that in here. This is a new invention. So we're going to give you this later filing date. Didn't really cover it. They yeah. The yeah. Right. Any other questions? Are the questions from the interweb? If you have a provisional patent file, does that protect national side? Oh, that's a good question. I assumed it would be. I oh, well, Terry's going to answer it. Let's try that. Um, as long as there's been no enabling public disclosure, provisional patent establishes the priority date upon which you can file a PCT application. Are there any other questions? Okay. Well, that's my last slide. Yes, sir, Barry. Oh, oh to do a patent search? Yeah. Well, some people will use outside firms to do it. Um, well, I would say if you're going to really do it, it'd take at least a few weeks, a few months, okay? And there are people, there are people who are amazing at it, and then there's everybody else, okay? So um, you can probably find some things, but there's a whole—I mean, there's a whole talk you can dive into about how to do a good patent search because if you find one patent that is close. Scroll down and look at the prior art, the references in there, the citations, what it references and what other patents reference it. And you are going to find it is just like this maze of other things to look at. It is, you can keep going down these rabbit holes, okay, and really go out. So to do an exhaustive search, it will take a long time. I can tell you what, the work... To make the process go as smooth as you can, you need to do as much work as you can ahead of time so that when you go to Terry or whoever, you don't just go, hey, Terry, here's an idea, and make him do everything, right? You probably know more about the competitive products that are out there, so you have a better understanding. So your job is to go and look what is out there, do your assessment, and then come and bring that and say, hey, here's the idea. This is how we're different from these people that are out there. This is the unique 
component. This is our invention, right? This is what's different and go into all that kind of detail. So the more work you do, the less work the attorney has to do, the better. Because attorneys are really expensive, okay? And nobody knows it better than you. You know more, okay? So you want to help them as much as you can in doing that. Uh, the one thing I will say, claims, in my opinion, I don't think any engineer or scientist should be trying to draft claims. I think that should be the attorney's job. Because it is an art. And to, to really do a good one, let them do it, because you have no experience in doing it. So I, when people put it in the provisional, that, it drives me nuts. Oh. Do you recommend going into I-Corps with IP? Um, sometimes I do provisional Wait, going into I-Corps with IP? The only thing about, well, I guess the way i is structured is sometimes you are looking for a home for your technology. But a lot of people in i will pivot, and they may go to something that's not even related to their technology. Um, I would recommend you talk to Harold Solomon, who's over there, or I can't remember who the other guy is, or somebody else who's like an i person who works with a lot of the BME kind of people. A couple of questions. One is a follow-up from the provisional patent asking that if data is presented at a conference, would that be the unprotected Wait, is the provisional in place before they present it? No, it's in the act, but I feel I don't think As long as the provisional covers what they're presenting on, then it protects them. But if they are presenting before they have filed whatever they're presenting on, then it doesn't protect that. <laughs> Oh boy, I, I can say I know zero about that. That is, I'm going to kick that one right So there. software is really hard to get a patent on just because of some relatively recent Supreme Court rulings on patentability of software. If it's tied to or coupled with a device, it's much easier to get claims around the software. We have been successful in getting some pure software patents in the last few years and actually have done a few startups around those, but you, you have to be really careful about uh, describing the um, patentable aspects of it according to the criteria of the patent office. Uh, it's, it, you, it can be done, but it's really, really hard. I wanted to add, is there a follow-up to that? Uh, yeah, okay. it's, um, does the patent for a system rely on the patent for the system? I didn't catch the question. I don't think I understood it. Can you ask him to reframe it, maybe? Sure. Okay. Yeah, uh, it, uh, does the process or the product work? I mean, if, if do, do you have to demonstrate it works? Demonstrate no. It works you don't have to make it. No, that's one of the things. Back in the day, long time ago, you used to have to submit a prototype with your application. And they used to, there used to be a huge warehouse where they stored all the inventions right from each patent. And then that thing burned down. So then they built another one. And they started storing them all in there. And then that one burned down. And then they said, OK, we're not going to collect these things anymore. So you actually do not ever have to have made it or tested it. So you don't have to. You have it. to do what's called constructive enablement. You have to basically describe it sufficiently right. through words and pictures yeah. that someone could understand what it is. The only thing that the patent office still requires a physical prototype of is a perpetual motion machine. <laughs> That was funny. Um, one, I was going to make one point about patents. People talk about patents and the time frame. I don't think they appreciate the time frame uh, to get a patent. Um, the answer I get is, how long does it take to get a patent? And the answer is, it varies, and it varies significantly. So you can get one. You can file it, and if it's awesome and simple and clear and all that stuff, maybe within you know 12 or 18 months, you can get one granted. But like I got a patent. I got a patent from something I worked on in my first job out of school, okay? And it, that, so the, from the start to the end date of when it was granted was like 11 years, okay? So don't, so it's a marathon. These are not sprints to get your patent, and they're big investments. They're a lot of money, and they're a lot of time, 
So I don't want anybody to have this misconception that they're going to file this thing and next month they're going to get this patent. No, it's going to be a year, two, five. It's going to take some time. Just constructive enablement. You basically have to be able to sufficiently describe the invention both in words and drawings such that the Enable. patent examiner and someone skilled in the art could understand it. Enablement's the big keyword. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, do you? Oh, I. I I I don't really mess with the classification numbers because I feel like I've seen that misused a lot of times. I mean, it really depends on the use. So if they have use claim use claims that are different that would cause it to drop into a different R unit, that's when it's going to um, seem to be very different, even though the technology itself may be similar. If it's applied in a very different way, um, it would probably end up in a different R unit for examination. This is the first time I've had classification as a question. Great question. Are there any other questions? These are all great questions, and I'm impressed. Oh, Dr. Perdue. It's all, I mean, it all comes down to what the prior art that is out there, what are you trying to claim, what have you disclosed. So it's a converse, and it, and it will differ on the patent examiner. So it goes to the patent office, and they give it to person X. Well, if you give it to person Y, they may process it a lot faster. X may have more at their table. Um, and then it's the back and forth. So they may look at it and say, hey, Michelle, you didn't see there's this prior art out here which impacts the claim you're asking for, so why don't you take a look at it? So then it comes back to you, and you do work, and you reframe your claim, and you say, okay, well, this is what we're going to try. Then you send it back to them, and they say, well, that's great, but this looks similar to this other thing. You need to reframe. So it goes back and forth. You can actually, in the patent and trademark office, you can go in this thing called the file wrapper, and you can actually see the communications between the patent office and the attorney, okay? So you will see like this line of all these communications. So if it's simple and straightforward and there's an, the prior art's not really out there, those go a lot quicker. It also seems that part of that would be like the patent application is very thorough and you really identified all the prior art, you're probably in better. Yeah, I would think so. And I know some people too will set up a meeting with the patent office and they'll actually go up there and they'll have a meeting with the examiner to kind of help show it and explain it, and that, that helps it along. I don't know how often they do that. Yeah, and you can even do that by telephone. You don't have to travel, but interviews with examiners can be very helpful to overcome objections. You know, quite frankly, quite often examiners don't really fully understand your invention. Yeah. So being on the phone with them can be really helpful. Yeah, you have to think, I mean, these examiners, a, a lot of the examiners I know, this was like their first job out of college, right? So it's not like they've been doing it for 30 years and they know everything in that area. They're, I mean, they're new to it too, and they're looking, and they may not know where to look, and so yeah, it, it I, really I've seen, varies. I've seen office actions come back, and I literally said to my colleague, "Did, did this guy read the same patent application we sent in?" I mean, the the <laughs> the rejection was just so off base. Yeah. Um, the other thing I'll mention is there is actually an accelerated examination process that yeah. you can do on the front end. You pay extra fees for that, and mm -hmm. supposedly you can get patents through as, as early as six to 12 months. Um, they got the highway, uh, that one, yeah, highway prosecution, exactly what the, something like that. Um, for universities, that's not something we typically want to do because we typically are filing patents at our expense. We're trying to find a licensee to pick up those expenses, as James alluded to earlier. For companies, you may want to get that patent issued faster, so it may be worth the extra money because the until the patent is issued, you don't have anything to enforce. Any other questions? Anything else, Christine? So we can wrap up. Oh, oh. 
you have any examples when a company will file an administrative federal patent versus separate patent? Well, each patent is a single invention. So you may do a family of patents. So you may do something that's like in an area and you're doing multiples of them to protect it, but a patent can only have one invention. So like Apple doesn't just have one iPhone patent, they have it for each invention within the iPhone. I don't know if that answers the question or not. Yeah, and you may file an in, a, you may file a patent application and the patent office will come back and issue what's called a restriction requirement. And they'll basically say, okay, we've examined your application, but you actually have four different inventions here. And these are the claims that we think are tied to each of these four inventions. You have to pick a claim set to move forward with. Ultimately, if you want to pursue all of those, you would have to divide that into four different patent applications. Yeah, I and mean, there's like a limit on the number of claims you can do. I mean, there's there's certain things to it, but okay. All right, well, great questions. I hope it was of value to you somewhat. Um, if you have any questions, Terry will be here.